I'm happy to introduce Ken Alexander from the University of Southern California. And he's going to tell us about disjointness of geodesics for first passage population in the plane. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to uh, Arjun, Jack, and Reedy for organizing this wonderful meeting. Greetings from Los Angeles. I would like to be there, but that was not possible. So we're doing it this way. Um, the subject of my talk, um, as the title suggests, is a pretty uh, straightforward problem, but the, of course the solution never is. Um, <clears throat> so we have um, the usual setup uh, with passage times denoted tau e, and then the um, passage time of a path gamma is the sum of the tau e's over gamma, and the passage time between points of the square lattice, we are in two dimensions throughout this talk, so square lattice, um, the passage time is the infimum over paths. And as we know, under mild conditions, the infimum is achieved and uniquely so if you have a continuous distribution and we do assume those things. Um, the geodesic, the minimizing path, we denote gamma sub xy for the geodesic from x to y. Now for the context of this talk, it's most natural to think of uh, T as a random metric or pseudo metric actually on the lattice. And uh, to understand that metric, uh, especially in the context of the, the scaling limit, which uh, you know, Timo discussed, uh, Timo Sepalainen discussed in his talk last night, the directed landscape, um, it's important to understand the geometry of geodesics. And one of the basic questions is when are they disjoint? So if you have two geodesics, there's, uh, you can make three parameters, the length of the geodesics L, the separation at one end, call that A, and the other end separation, B. So as a function of L, A, and B, what's the probability of disjointness? How does this behave? So disjoint is, means just the, the left picture as opposed to the right. Although we'll actually see, we'll, we'll modify that a bit later in a sense. Now, we believe that the wandering exponent for how far these geodesics wander from straight lines um, when the length L, uh, it should be L to the two thirds. So that means you would expect disjointness if the, if the length, the separations A and B are much bigger than L to the two thirds. And it's not likely to be disjoint if, um, if the separations are much less than L to the two thirds. Um, <clears throat> now, a, a closely related question uh, was looked at by Hammond for the case of Brownian last passage percolation, which is an integral model. So you have this picture uh, here, you have two intervals of length L to the, well, let's say a small multiple of L to the two thirds, some epsilon, and you ask what's the probability that there are K disjoint geodesics connecting them. Now you don't expect to see more than one because these are, uh, geodesics are starting and ending close enough together that they should be able to coalesce. But you could have, you know, many more than one. And so the, the answer is that it decays like epsilon to the k squared minus one over two. But that's obtained using things like the RSK correspondence and the Brownian Gibbs property that, you know, either are inaccessible and for first passage percolation and provide no kind of probabilistic geometric intuition. And the, but these uh, results are central to a sequence of papers Hammond wrote about, uh, uh, you know, analyzing things like the, um, how passage times vary uh, you move, when you look sort of transversally to the direction of the geodesics and so on. Now, if you, if you take Hammond's answer here, um, so our, our situation is not exactly, but it's sort of like the K equals two situation. And yes, equal um, lengths at the other end. So we should take A equals B and of order L to the two thirds. Uh, it suggests that the answer in our situation um, when A equals B should look like A to the three halves over L. So that's like a guess for A equals B. But what can we prove for first passage using what's available, which is just probabilistic and geometric methods? And, and you know, why is it three halves here? And also what if in this, uh, in this picture, what if the A and B are way less than L to the three halves? Maybe we wanna take A and B constant and let L go to infinity, then what happens? Um, or if it's very unequal, it's, you know, the A is much smaller than the B. In fact, I'll always assume, um, just to kind of normalize things, that the A at the left end is smaller, less than or equal to the B at the right end. So of course we believe fluctuations of the passage time are of order X to the chi for some chi. Um, there's two ways that you could formalize that, kind of an upper and lower bound in a sense. 
you could look at the variance and say, what exponent does that grow with? And kind of a lower exponent is given by, if you take the, the log divided by two log n for the passage time to n e1, um, and then take the limb inf to make it a lower value, we'll call that chi minus. So that certainly exists. Um, and then upper fluctuation exponent is provided that the passage times have an exponential moment, we can look for the smallest chi for which this, when we take the, the, the discrepancy that we're, that we're trying to bound, that's the fluctuations we're talking about, and divide by n to the chi, then that stays bounded in n. Um, so that's like a really kind of an upper exponent. Now, we do have to, in, because our result is going to involve a statement with the, the exponents, uh, you know, the, the, the primary exponents chi and xi um, in it, and they're not known to exist, we have to make some assumptions so that we, so that they do exist. This is similar to like in, in Chatterjee's 2011 paper where we proved that um, chi equals two xi minus one, but you have to assume that both exponents exist in some way to do that. So what I, my assumption is just that these, uh, this upper and lower one are equal to some, with some positive value. So that is an unproven assumption. And then there's the transverse fluctuation exponent, which is the xi such that, that characterizes how far geodesics wander from a straight line. And just, whoops, just to sort of um, review that there's a connection between this wandering and the curvature of the limit shape, its boundary. So you have this asymptotic approximation that I you know g of x, this, uh, this limit here, um, which is a norm. Um, and the unit ball of that norm is the limit shape. And what curvature of the boundary does is control the strictness of the triangle inequality for that norm. So if you have a picture like this, where you compare distance zero to V plus V to X and compare that to just distance zero to X, how much extra distance is there? Well, in the Euclidean norm, um, if the transverse um, distance here is L, then it looks like L squared over X. The, the, or, that's the scale of it. Um, so if, the, if you have curvature of the boundary, then the same thing holds for the norm G. So that tells you sort of the cost of wandering a certain distance away from the straight line. And there's this idea, which is probably you know, familiar to most of you, but if you have, if this uh, X is, is of some order R, and you look at the standard deviation, and that has some order sigma of R, then the transverse fluctuations we expect to be given by square root of R sigma of R. And the reason for that is that um, if you look at this, this curvature, um, if, if because of the, um, because of the curvature, the, uh, there, there's an ex, this extra distance is, is in the G norm is basically given by like this distance U to V plus the similar one on the right. And um, so the, the transverse wandering will be in, in some sense, a fluctuation has to make up for that extra distance, the fluctuations of the passage time. Um, so that means that the standard deviation should be at least of the standard deviation at the largest possible deviation um, should match with the size of that gap that's created by the curvature. And that's where this relation uh, uh, xi equals one plus chi over two comes from. And if, you, if you're more, if you don't assume exponents exist, we don't state it in terms of exponents, it just says that the transverse wandering should look like this delta of R. Um, excuse me. So this delta of R, which you'll see a lot in this talk, it characterizes the typical transverse wandering when, this, when the standard deviation of the passage time at distance r is some sigma of r. Um, so what I'm doing is basically taking this formula, in, in Chatterjee's case, he assumed that a chi and xi exist and showed they had to satisfy this relation. What I'm doing is um, in effect, assuming chi exists and then taking this as a definition of, of xi. And then you can prove that, not, not in this talk, but separately, you can prove that the, that really does characterize the transverse wandering. Anyway, so back to the question of disjoint geodesics, here's something that gives us a hint about the answer. We can, there's this tree of geodesics that you get um, from the origin when you look at all, in this case, all geodesics out to some boundary of some ball, let's say at a distance approximately L um, with a rooted at zero. 
And we can take some intermediate radius here, this uh, arc that you see, and ask how many geodesics cross there. You know, the, the geodesics kind of coalesce as you move toward the origin and then branch out. So how many are there when you reach this point? Well, you expect that the spacing to be of this order, delta of r, um, at radius r. In other words, if we take the radius to be delta inverse of a for some a, then we expect the spacing to be of order a because any geodesics closer than that can wander enough to coalesce. So this is just a heuristic. Um, <clears throat> we, can ask, we can ask the question a little different from our original one. If I pick, take these two points P and Q that are separated by distance B, and I look at their geodesics going back toward the origin, and I go back to the point where they should be separated by of order A at this radius delta inverse of A. And I say, are they disjoint going back that far? Um, now, so how does that work? Well, if you look at the, going out from the origin, if you look at the different crossing points of this inner arc here, and you look at all the points in the outer arc where, where the geodesic comes through that point, then you, it makes these intervals with these gaps in between them. Like all the points, the gaps are these little green marks here. Um, and uh, the what's in between there, um, let's see, maybe we can annotate this to help. Um, um, what's in between there um, is all the points that came through here. And, and then so you have these, these intervals with common um, exit points at the intermediate arc there and then gaps in between those intervals. And in order for this to have this disjointness I mentioned, you have to have precisely one of those gaps fall between P and Q. So we can ask how many gaps are there? Well, if the spacing here is A, that means the angular spacing is A over delta inverse of A. And then you get the same angular spacing out here at radius L, which is much bigger. And that tells you what the gap spacing should be. It's this red uh, formula over here. So, and then we, ex then you can say, okay, if that's the spacing and they're just kind of randomly placed along this boundary, then the probability one falls in this interval of length B would be like um, the B divided by the spacing. So that's kind of our guess. We say, okay, um, we, we have, this does give us two um, disjoint geodesics with the right spacing A at the left and B at the right. Of course, now we haven't, we don't have fixed points at the left end, they could be anywhere. So it's not quite the same, but still it feels the same. So we can ask, is it true that the probability of disjointness looks like that? Um, delta inverse of A, B over AL, which if you give that in terms of exponents, it would be th these exponents. Now it's interesting that the A and B, the widths at the two ends, the narrow one gets a different exponent from the, um, uh, from the the wider one B, um, and but, but it is true though that if you if you take if, if you plug in xi equals two thirds and a equals B, you do get what agreement with what Hammond uh, got. So that looks promising. Um, so let's see what actually happens. Now, in order to actually do this, we have to modify our context a little bit. So we stay in two dimensions, but instead of the square lattice we want to exploit radial symmetry. And that requires that we look at uh, an isotropic random graph. So we want this graph to be as lattice-like as possible. We don't want to deviate too much from the lattice. So what are some properties we want? We want it to be planar and isotropic and stationary and ergodic. We want the size of holes in this graph to be bounded in the sense that every, well, we can, let's say unit ball contains at least one vertex. Um, I'm gonna erase here. Don't want those marks anymore. Um, also a finite range of dependence. We want a lot of independence in this graph so that things, unless they happen very close to each other, they're, they're independent. Um, we want what's called bounded dilation, which means if you take any two points, vertices of this graph, and look at their Euclidean separation and look at their separation by a, the shortest path in the graph, then it's within a constant. And we want also a good control on the local, we don't want there to be too high a density of vertices uh, for this thing. So we say, okay, probability of n vertices in a unit ball should decay exponentially in n. 
This bounded dilation, I will mention, holds for every Delaunay triangulation, which is the one you get associated with a Voronoi um, diagram. And the constant C is slightly less than two, proved by Shia in 2013. Now, it's not obvious a process exists with these properties, um, but that's in a separate uh, work of mine. There exists a point process for which the Delaunay triangulation does have these properties. And that process is uh, built from something with even more independence, which is just a space-time point process. And that allows us later to use things like the Vandenberg-Keston inequality on this. But yeah, this is a, a context which is made as lattice-like as possible, but it's, um, it's not a lattice. Um, it's, uh, it's, state, it's isotropic. It's the main thing. It's radially symmetric, so we can exploit that later. And it should, I mean, heuristically, it should be no different from the lattice in terms of properties of uh, first passage percolation that are of interest. And to make it even more lattice-like, we define the passage times by taking, the passage times are not IID, but the speeds are. So the passage times are defined as omega E times the length of E, Euclidean length, where the omega E's are IID. And um, one good thing about isotropic also is that the limit shape can only be a Euclidean ball. So we don't need to prove or anything about curvature of the boundary, we got that. There, is, there are some things that we have to be careful of though. Um, the FKG property is only valid after you condition on the graph. So that is a problem in some arguments, which we work around, but you won't see that here. As I mentioned the uh, vandenberg keston reimer inequality, um, where we really need the Reimer improvement for what we're doing, um, it still applies in cases where we need it. Um, because of the finite range of dependence of this graph and the fact that it's built from a space-time Poisson process. So that turns out to be enough. So the core assumptions for our work are that the graph is a lattice-like random graph, as I described, um, in the plane. The speeds uh, along edges are continuous random variables with a finite exponential moment. <laughs> and there's a unique fluctuation exponent as I described before, there's this upper and lower one and they're the same and it's not zero. Any questions um, so far? I can't see the, the chat. So I guess uh, maybe if there's anything that comes up there, one of the organizers can tell me. Everything okay? There's nothing, there's no questions so far. Right? Okay, good. All right, so uh, when I say a subpolynomial, I, I mean that a function that grows slower than any power, a function of R that grows slower or shrinks slower than any power of R. So under the core assumptions, there exists constants um, and a subpolynomial function such that if you take any um, large enough A and B and L, um, and then you specify these points so that X and Y are separated by A, P and Q are separated by B and the horizontal separation is L, then indeed the probability they are disjoint is the formula suggested, um, this ratio here to within this subpolynomial function. You have a lower bound and upper bound with, uh, you know, the differ by a subpolynomial factor. But that is what we prove. Um, <clears throat> Now there's a second theorem that looks unrelated, but it turns out that the same machinery gets it. Um, it's what I call a small, what you might call a small tube theorem. So under those same core assumptions, um, the, again, there are constants and subpolynomial functions. So that if you look at um, values epsilon that are small, but not too small relative to the uh, distance r, you can ask what's the probability that you're, geodesic does not wander very much. It stays in a tube of size r to the xi, um, except we're forced to put in this subpolynomial factor. So there's some xi one of r that's subpolynomial. So we're really looking at what's the probability it stays in a tube on that scale. And if you take a small epsilon, this says that that's very unlikely. It goes down like e to the minus epsilon to the minus one over xi. 
And again, there's some subpolynomial func factor there that's correcting it. So, but at least it's it's the correct exponent, r to the xi. It says that the, the, the wandering really is at least of order at the scale of what exponent the xi really is, it has the, the right one, the one that's um, uh, defined as one plus chi over two. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a similar result for um, last passage percolation uh, by Basu and Bhatia um, that doesn't does not have these uh, subpolynomial corrections. Um, that's the uh, that's what you get when you get to use uh, the integrable um, aspects of LPP. So it's the same thing, but without that. But it means that this really is. I mean, it's optimal up to the subpolynomial factors. Now the relation of this um, uh, small tube theorem to, uh, to earlier results, Chatterjee's result that I already mentioned um, says that um, if you have an exponent which characterizes fluctuations in the sense I gave that the, the, the chi plus and chi minus are the same, and you have a similar thing for some psi with the transverse wandering, there's some way you can define an upper and lower exponent there as well, um, then they have to satisfy this relation. Now, what you get from the theorem I just stated is a little bit different. You don't have to assume anything about the xi. You just say if there's a chi, which satisfies, you know, which is well defined in the sense that chi plus and chi minus are the same, then if you define xi by that relation, then it does characterize transverse wandering. So you don't, you don't have to assume anything about xi in order to get this. So it's in that sense, it's an improvement when you combine it with an upper bound. What I gave was just a lower bound for wandering and then there's an upper bound um, in an earlier paper of mine that says the wandering is not of any larger order than that delta, delta of, of R. Now the common proof ingredient for these two results is crossing point bounds. So what do I mean like that? Let's consider um, geodesics, well, they come slab ones, so they don't go outside the, the, the lines at the ends. Between vertical hyperplanes, we'll call them H0 and HR, separated by distance R. And we'll take these the starting and ending intervals um, to be delta of R, except, well, I'm gonna throw in an extra log factor, so it doesn't matter what the power is, just ignore that. And then some intermediate value, let's say between you know, one third or two thirds or whatever of the way. And you can ask, okay, how many um, points are there in this HS where some geodesic crosses there? It might be several geodesics crossing in the same point or just one or whatever, but how many different points are crossing points of geodesics? So you have this tangle like of spaghetti and you say, okay, the spaghetti is crossing different strands of spaghetti are crossing each other all over the place. One thing we do know though, is that because they're geodesics, no two pieces of spaghetti can touch each other on both sides of, of S. They either touch on the left or on the right. That can happen, but that not both. Um, so <clears throat> an observation related to that is that if you have N geodesics pass through a common point, I'll call that a popular site, let's say on the left side, could be the right just as well, um, so if there's some point here, um, like here, there's two geodesics passing through the, the point I'm pointing to there, then on the right side, those two geodesics cannot touch each other. Um, so if you have n points that all, n geodesics that all pass through the same point, then you get n ge disjoint geodesics on the other side. Now there's a deterministic result using that that says, if you start with n cubed geodesics on the left, so that's your tango of spaghetti, and they each have a um, different crossing point at S. Then you can find a subcollection of N of them um, for which either all the geodesics are disjoint on the left of S or they're all disjoint on the right. So the picture is has them on the left of S. So if this, this is N cubed geodesics and this is N geodesics on, on the right there, and now they're disjoint at least on one side of S. So you can always find that. And just quickly why that's so, um, if you order your geodesics, you, when you, this is the ones you start with, your mess of spaghetti, 
Um, order them based on the ordering of the in the left where they start. They start in some line, just go from top to bottom. You might have multiple geodesics coming from the same point, like all the red ones in this top picture. Um, then use the ordering on the right to break ties. So that gives you an ordering on the left. And then you have an ordering on the right because they all have different crossing points. So you just order them based on where their crossing point is. So you have a permutation of the <clears throat> of one through n cubed that, that these geodesics create. Now, if that permutation has an increasing subsequence, that means that the geodesics, they can still touch each other, but they can't cross <clears throat> um, on, the, on the left side, of, you know, between zero and S. They cannot, they cannot cross each other, um, but they can touch. Now, if you had two, if you've num numbered them this way and you have um, two geodesics whose indices are separated by N and they're not disjoint, that means all the others, um, you know, let's say I had geodesics 10 through 20 and they meet, then, then all the others 11, 12, 13 through 19 are sandwiched in between. So then you have this popular site if, there's, if you have N of them that way. So there has to be a popular site um, if, the, if geodesics whose indices are separated by N are, um, are not disjoint. So either, if you have an increasing uh, subsequence, then either you have a popular site, which, which as we saw, gives you disjoint geodesics on the other side of S that's not visible here, or you have um, every, if you take every nth geodesic, you get a set that's disjoint on the left side. So that's for an increasing subsequence. If you had a decreasing subsequence, then that means they all cross each other. They start out in some order, and then on the right side, they're in the opposite order. They all crossed. Um, so they all touched. So that means they have to be disjoint on the right. So then you, you have disjoint geodesics on, to the right of S, which again, you cannot see in this picture. And happily, there is the erdish Secker. I don't know how you pronounce the name, Shekerish theorem, that says that um, any permutation, if you have a permutation of n cubed, then either there's an increasing subsequence of length n squared or a decreasing one of length n. And either way, you end up with n disjoint geodesics on one side or the other of S. And that's not quite enough to get what we want. Um, we want to, uh, um, Uh, now, when, when, now that we've got the lemma, we, we want to use that to say that it's unlikely that you have these uh, n disjoint geodesics, and therefore unlikely that you had n cubed crossing points, separate crossing points of geodesics. Um, it's, I won't go into the details of that, but you have to be careful, even though they're disjoint, the fact that, that they are geodesics does not occur just on the geodesic path. So these are not disjoint occurrences in the vandenberg keston reimer sense. So, you know, I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm pointing out there's still work to do, but it's where we made a lot of progress when we get to having disjoint geodesics instead of a tangle of spaghetti. Okay, so let's go back to the theorem um, to prove disjointness. We've got these points X and Y on the left separated by A, P and Q on the right separated by B, and the, the horizontal separation is L. So those are the three parameters, A, B, and L. And we want the approximate formula, which was ratios of powers of those. Now, so I, I start with the question, what does disjoint mean? Now, you probably think, you know, you know, you say, oh, it means they don't touch. Well, my job is first to re-educate you about what disjoint means. Here's what it really means. It means that if we take the diagonal geodesic, it could be either one, let's say x to q, then there's a there's going to be a bifurcation point somewhere along that where the geodesic to P splits off. And also going leftward, there's some bifurcation point starting from Q where you split between X and Y. And disjoint means that as you go from X to Q on the diagonal one, the rightward bifurcation comes before the leftward one, just like in the picture. If you stare at it a moment, you see that that's true. So, presuming you've stared at it. Um, <clears throat> what I, I want to do is subdivide the event of disjointness according to the scales of 
where these bifurcation points are. So how do I make the scales? Well, I've got my X and Y at the left here. And I, I, I want to put an origin, put zero at a point so that um, in keeping with the first picture that I gave when, when I was talking about the hint, um, you want delta inverse of A to be the radius from, from the origin to X and Y. So that this is kind of the natural spacing of geodesics at that radius. So I'll call that R sub A for, for short, that's delta inverse of A. And then the scales are just powers of two starting from that. So RA to two RA is the first scale, two to four RA is the second and so on. So there's some jth and kth scale where these occur. Um, I'm gonna kind of focus on the situation where the bifurcations occur more toward the left side. You can kind of symmetrically deal with the right side. Um, or if they occur somewhere in the middle, that's a different argument, but let's just think about them as being somewhere maybe in the left half. Um, so naturally at some scale, starting from the left side. Um, now, this, because the left, the rightward bifurcation precedes the leftward one, the, uh, the scale for it has to be less than or equal to, if this is the jth scale and this is the kth, then you have to have j less than or equal to k. So that you have to look at all the different possible J's and K's where the, uh, for the scales where these bifurcations might occur on the diagonal geodesic. So let's look at the rightward bifurcation in a little more detail. So um, if, if the bifurcation occurs on the J scale going rightward, what does that mean? So what I want to do is make what I call an annular sector. Um, well, actually, let me not get to the annular sector yet. Um, <clears throat> I have at the radius, um, I look at the radii that, that define the jth scale, two to the j minus one ra and two to the j ra. And the bifurcation occurring means that when I look at the geodesics from x to p and q, they have the same crossing point um, at two to the j minus one RA, but different crossing points um, at two to the j RA, because they're bifurcated. So that means that um, when you look over at the right side here, that there is indeed one of these gaps. If I look at all the points that came through, let's say point uh, V, that came through U and then V on their way to the boundary over here, there's some interval of those. And then the ones that came from U and then W, there's an interval of those, and then there's a gap between them, and that has to lie somewhere between P and Q. Um, <clears throat> so that we have one of these arc gaps in there. Now, I want to think of the tree not based at X. I want to think of it as rooted at this U. So I'm, I have the tree that's rooted at U, and then I look at where the points cross um, the I mean, U is at scale two, at, at radius two to the J minus one RA, and I want to look where they cross at two to the J RA, and that determines these arcs and the gaps that separate them over at the right side. Now, um, we had the lemma that says that um, if I look at geodesics, I make this sort of what I call annular sector, just the intersection of an annulus with some wedge. Um, and I look at the geodesics as they pass through that. I'm going to gloss over, you know, how do I control and make sure that the geodesics do pass through that? I make the sector, um, the, the natural spacing width, delta of two to the JRA, and then an extra log factor, which is enough to force them to pass through the sector with high, high probability. So let's just take it that they're all passing through here. Um, I look at them going from the, the inner boundary, which is a little bit further inside, and then the outer edge of the sector is, is past the J radius. Um, and because of that, there are not very many crossing points um, at, the, at the two radii I've marked, two to the J minus one RA, two to the J RA. There are not many here. There's the U, V, and W, and some others, but there's just some subpolynomial number of them with high probability. So that means that if, well, if I fix any U, you know, if I have like 20 crossing points over here, that means there can be only 20 gaps over there, in, at least in the scale that sort of the arc that corresponds to the, the angle of this sector. Um, and if I have only like 10 different points U over here, then each one can produce, each one will produce different gaps uh, on the right possibly. Um, but still I only have, you know, 10 times 20 different possible gaps on the right, no matter what U, V and W are involved. 
So the, the, basically the number of crossing points controls how many gaps are possible on the right side even when I look at all geodesics, no matter what I use as the root, I'm going to use the root as some, one of the crossing points over here. No matter what root I use, if I put all those gaps together, there's not very many of them over here. Just some subpolynomial number as a function of this radius due to the JRA. So we want to say that makes it unlikely there's any gap between P and Q, if there are not very many gaps overall. And we have the radial symmetry, which I you know, went to, had to modify the model in order to obtain that. So that's what, why we need this radial symmetry to, to try to make this argument into something rigorous. Questions about that? This is an important picture for what comes, for what follows. Okay. Same thing for the leftward bifurcation with a li little bit of a tweak. Um, so I have these, the geodesic, the diagonal one goes from X over here to Q over there. And now I wanna think of the geodesics as moving rightward. Um, there's also the geodesic from, um, from X to P, that's the, the, the green one here, but that's not really important for this picture. I'm focusing on what happens with the leftward bifurcation, which is at this point Y. Now, Leftward, I have, because of the bifurcation, there's just one crossing point coming from Q going over toward the line containing X and Y, call it U prime. And then there's two different crossing points for the destinations X and Y um, at the inside. And that's because the bifurcation occurred on the case scale between those two radii. So I can again say, okay, if I look at all these geodesics and I wanna take now U prime as the root here, of my tree and say, okay, if I had a tree with that root, I can look where do the points cross this radius on their way to this line. And then that makes intervals in this line that are again, separated by gaps. And in order for the bifurcation to occur on the case scale, it means that one of those gaps is between X and Y on the vertical line. Um, and again, there's not very many choices of these points U prime, V prime, W prime, these crossing points, because we controlled that that's on just a subpolynomial function of, well, really of this radius two to the KRA. So it's a similar picture, except for technical reasons at the narrow end A, I use this vertical line instead of the, uh, the boundary of a ball to, to, to locate the arcs and the gaps that are created. So here's the picture. Now, now you know what disjointness means. It doesn't mean they don't touch. It means you have these geodesics, you have the diagonal one, the bifurcation points occurring at some scales, j and k. -th. And for the rightward bifurcation, um, one of the corresponding gaps, when you look at geodesics from this root u going out to the boundary of the ball, one of the gaps falls between p and q. And similarly, leftward, um, if you look at the root u prime um, and you make geodesics from there and go to the boundary, then one of the corresponding gaps created at this radius falls between x and y. Okay, so now we're trying to bound the probability of this disjointness. So we want to understand how unlikely is this picture to occur? So let's just look at the rightward direction first, the gaps between P and Q situation. So if we have this, uh, this annular sector whose width is, is basically the, this delta, this natural uh, wandering distance at scale two to the JRA supplemented by an extra log factor. And then you can say, okay, take that, you know, and project it out to distance L and then it becomes this length. And how many gaps are there? Well, the, the number of possible gaps, even if we look at all the possible roots over here, it's just the product of um, how many crossing points there are here and how many there are at radius two to the JRA. So that's this factor here when we talk about what's the density of these arc gaps over on the right there. And so if you take that number of gaps and divide by the length of this arc, which is really what I've done here. And I put in blue all the things that are, you should really pay attention to. The other ones are just subpolynomial factors like the log and the psi. 
So the blue is the important thing. So the probability then we expect of finding one, kind of like what I said before, that the probability of finding one between P and Q, which is a um, some arc of length B inside this here, there's some little arc of length B we're focusing on, it should be at most that density of gaps multiplied by B. So that gives us something that looks kind of like what we want. We're trying to show that the probability looks like just this ratio over here without the two to the J times one minus Xi. And here's the subpolynomial function occurring there also. So um, it, it looks, you know, that it, it's related, but it's, we're not done yet because we only consider the rightward one. So the leftward is basically similar. The probability of a gap between X and Y should look like, um, the well, the um, width here's the width of the sec. Here's the sorry, the width of the uh, uh, sector. Well, let's see, a little, it's basically the same picture. I can't describe it without uh, having a, drawn a similar picture. But basically, what we come up with is, is something that looks like one over two to the kz when it's coming from um, scale k. The kth scale is where the bifurcation rightward or sorry, leftward occurs. Then um, the probability for finding the, the gap in the right place looks like one over two to the case i with again a subpolynomial correction. Now, if the leftward and rightward gap events are roughly independent, then we will get that the probability of gaps between on both ends at the left end and the right end, which is what we need, the probability of having both of them when we multiply together, um, probability of having both of them you know, occurring on the j's and k's scales will look like this blue thing with some subpolynomial um, factors thrown in. And we can sum that over the different scales, j and k, um, using the fact that um, this i is always at least a half. So the one minus i in the numerator is smaller than this i in the denominator. So that lets us sum over j less than or equal k um, over all such j and k and get what that would give us what we want, that the probability of the, that they're disjoint. And again, we've really only dealt with, uh, let's say, when both bifurcations occur in kind of like the left quarter of the picture, which turns out to be the most likely thing. They occur near the small end, but we don't know that yet. Um, so we have to, and then you can, you know, do a similar argument. If you do it going from the right instead of from the left, you get basically the same thing, but with the B and A interchanged which actually is a bigger probability. Um, I'm sorry, no, it's a smaller probability. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that suggests, by the way, that uh, also that the uh, largest um, probability comes if you have the J, equal, J and K both one which suggests that you're likely to have the bifurcation when the A is much smaller than B, the bifurcation is going to occur way over near A, the small end. Um, <clears throat> both bifurcations. But that's not essential for what we're doing here. Now, so the question is, okay, now we've got a sketch of what we want to do. How do we make it rigorous? Especially the part about the independence, the left end and the right end. That's a kind of troubling thing there. When we use averaging, Averaging showed up um, in Barbara Denman's talk, um, and it's a kind of similar thing here. I want to introduce it actually by um, doing the proof of that small tube theorem, at least, you know, just a rough sketch, um, because that illustrates it in a simpler context. So let me kind of interrupt this to do that proof, and then I'll go back to the other one. Actually, uh, yeah, I guess we're okay. Okay. Um, so what do we, what do we have here? Um, we want to show that the probability of the geodesic staying in this thin tube here, whose height is r to the xi divided by some subpolynomial function, and then multiplied by epsilon, goes down like um, epsilon to the minus one over xi. So what we do is we cover this thin tube with a certain number of blocks, that's this epsilon to the minus one over xi, whose length is r over, roughly r over n, let's say r over two n, and the height is um, 
that corresponds to this length L, it's this delta of L, the natural kind of spacing that goes with length L and with an extra log factor thrown in. And you think about like all the geodesics from end to end in this block and their crossing points in the middle of the block. In order for the geodesic to stay in the tube in that block, you have to have a crossing point in the tube because it can only you know, cross the middle at a crossing point. So the probability of successfully staying in the tube in the first block is bounded by the probability that there is a crossing point in the middle. And that's an independent event from block to block. We're just looking at all the geodesics that cross the block from the left side to the right side and saying, is there a crossing point in the middle, you know, in the tube rather. And each block only has some subpolynomial number as a function of the length L of those crossing points. We know that. So that's going to be the, what makes things work here. If we take the, how the averaging works is if you take the event that the, um, the let's say the ith block has a, I should say crossing point inside the, the thin tube, the dark one in the picture, well, let TS denote vertical translation by S, that does not affect the probability. If I take that configuration in the block and translate it up and down, it doesn't alter the probability of finding a crossing point inside the, the dark tube, the thin tube. Um, <clears throat> and if I look at all those translations, um, if there's, if Xi of L is the number of crossing points and, and I look at all the possible translations, which is the height of the tube, and I look at how many translations will give me a crossing point in the tube, then it's bounded by that product. So I can look at the probability of a crossing point in the tube as the expected value of the average over translations, vertical translations of this configuration. The gray tube stays fixed. I translate the configuration up and down and sometimes there'll be a crossing point in the tube and sometimes not. I'm ignoring what the uh, geodesic does outside, you know, away from that middle plane. I'm just asking, is there a crossing point in, at that point? And you can choose, you know, the parameters I chose, make it so that this is bounded away from one, let's say at most a half. And therefore the probability, if I go back to the last slide, is, is only a half probability in each block that I find a crossing point in the tube. So if there's n blocks, there's only a half to the n probability that I can do it in every tube and keep the entire path inside the tube. And that's basically where the theorem comes from. So that's the averaging, we're looking at, um, you know, we know how many of these crossing points there are. And so you shift the, con the configuration up and down and say, okay, only occasionally will the, one of those crossing points be inside the two. And the, the frequency of that gives you the probability because of the translation and variance of everything. So we're gonna use that in a more complicated way for the disjointness theorem. So again, here's what we wanna do. Um, we fix some scales, jth and kth, and we want to look at the probability of the event with the bifurcations occurring on the jth scale rightward and the kth scale going leftward. So we want to average now over rotations. So if you look at the bottom picture, we take the points x, y, p, q, and rotate them around um, the x plus y over 2 there. Um, and then the, the P, P of theta and Q of theta will rotate on the boundary of the ball, which is which we choose to have at center at this point. Um, so now we're looking at geodesic from X of theta to P of theta and Y of theta to Q of theta in that picture. It's the same probability. Everything's, uh, you know, rotationally uh, invariant. So we have the same probability. So we can average over these rotations. Um, so we have to be careful of this because you know, we have to like rot we have to use a rotated annular sector as well. And when you have a different annular sector there, this this thing in the middle that we look at, you know, the crossing points and all that um, on the J to K scale, then um, if you rotate it and have a different one, then there'll be all different crossing points. So, um, you know, you have to make sure that as you rotate, you don't kind of find places where there's excessive numbers of crossing points. Um, it has to be like uniformly subpolynomial let's say, but we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, so this, this helps us control, at least for the right side, we're gonna use that kind of averaging 
to say that as we rotate, we don't very often, there aren't very many gaps, so we don't very often find a gap among all these rotations. Not many rotations put place a gap between P of theta and Q of theta. So the configuration stays fixed. We just rotate the line and uh, well, rotate the, the sort of this axis between um, X of theta, Y of theta, P of theta, Q of theta, and rotate those points along with it. So that, that we rotate, but the configuration stays fixed. So all the gaps are staying in the same place. And as we rotate, you know, we, we don't see a gap between P of theta and Q of theta very often. That's, that's the idea here. So we can average over those. So that covers, that's how we control basically the gap presence probability on the right side. But we also have to worry about the left. Um, so what we also, what we do there is instead of rotations, it gets too complicated if you're like trying to rotate both ways. So on the left side, we use vertical translation. We have to make one little modification here. If you rotate, then the X of theta and Y of theta are no longer in the same vertical line like they were. Um, so, uh, you know, when you vertically translate, that's an issue, but instead of, we can replace the X of theta and Y of theta with some points X star and Y star, a little further out on the axis and show that um, if you have disjointness from X of theta and Y of theta to this, these destinations, then very likely you also have disjointness from X star and Y star. And then you can just use this same points, X star and Y star for all theta and, and only the P of theta and Q of theta are varying as you rotate. Um, so now we're gonna, when we look at vertical translations now, um, then the, we're gonna shift the whole picture, including this ball boundary and everything. We're gonna shift all that upward so that we can average on the left side over locations of gaps over there. Um, so now with the X star and Y star, when we do that translating, they, they stay in the vertical line. So we're, we're okay with that. So, um, and we also have to sort of discrete, what we do is to avoid issues with, um, you know, these crossing points, you have to discretize the locations of these annular sectors. It doesn't move in a continuous way. It's sort of, as we translate the, the annular sector, its angle and its vertical location that kind of moves and jumps. There's only finitely many values and you have to show that, you know, there aren't too many and they, yet they cover all the different translations that, that you need to make and rotations and so on. So it's some, you know, messy mixture of these two things, translation and rotation and, uh, and different annular sectors that you have to worry about the geodesics passing through for the different ones for different angles theta and different translations S. But you don't want to see those details, certainly. So the full averaging looks like this. Um, we have some range of angles that we want to average over, which is basically um, this A over delta inverse of A, the, the ang angle of, of the of the points at the left relative to the radius we associated there, the, 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 the leftmost annular sector, this is its angle, basically. And then the, for the, the vertical ones, we wanna average over um, something of scale, the, the, this delta corresponding to the, um, the, the distance to that annular sector. Um, so we take this event that you have disjointness and the bifurcations are occurring on the scales J and K. And we can say, okay, the probability of disjointness is um, we sum over all the possible scales, J and K of the bifurcations. And then for each scale, we look at all these, these rotations U theta over this range. It's, it's, it's a narrow range of rotations that we look at, just a small angle. Um, but we average over those, you know, from minus theta A to theta A. And we average over these vertical translations, TS over S between, you know, of, of this order of this delta um, wandering function. So uh, we bound then the probability for a fixed J and K by the average over these rotations and translations and use the fact that not very many of these events will occur because you, among all translations and rotations, there are very few that place gaps in the right places. Um, I'm glossing over some things, what are called aberrations. Um, I've said, you know, I make things that I like happen with high probability, 
but you know, what if they don't? <laughs> uh, what if they don't cooperate? So there are things like geodesics, the geodesics of interest have to pass through the annular sector that I had. I need limits on the number of crossing points, which is random after all. And I don't want geodesics to be to wander away from straightness. They need to uh, uh, stay relatively straight to do things like not, not bypass the annular sector and things like that. So it turns out that a lot of these things that can go wrong um, can be reduced to various versions of what I call fat triangles, where you have a geodesic with three points in it. And the if you look at those three points and the triangle and the distance G, this norm associated to the first passage process, um, the, uh, the, the sum of the distances by way of V um, exceeds that of the direct distance by of order the standard deviation, by order log R standard deviations, where R is the, the length of this, the picture there. Um, so if you have backtracking, then it creates one of these triangles. Um, you know, you go here, then you back up to V and then go forward to W, that makes one of these fat triangles. There's also other things that aren't quite, there. Well, it, it, it ultimately do involve these fat triangles. Like I, you know, made out like this doesn't happen, but it does. That sometimes a gap gets evaded. You know, you have some point on it's above a gap, and the geodesic goes around the gap and and makes its way back to the left um, on the other side of the gap. So you know, you have to control all that stuff. Um, and so what you do for that is um, you say, okay, there's some, all these different kinds of aberrations, bad things that can happen. You say, what's the biggest scale on which such a thing happens? So there's one scale on the left and one scale on the right, which might be zero, there might be no aberrations. And you say, okay, um, if it's the nth scale over here and the mth over there, it's different scales because you have different radii associated with A and with B. Um, then these are sort of basically reasonably independent. <clears throat> so you bound the probability by the probability of an aberration in here and the probability of an aberration over there. <clears throat> and, then the, and then you have disjointness without aberrations in between. So those geodesics are disjoint and, you, and now you don't have aberrations. So you can bound by that, bound the probability of that by what we already did when we assumed everything was nice. It really is nice in between. And then you can just sum over the M and N here and it gives you what you want. Um, now, there's also a, a lower bound, which also works by averaging, but I haven't talked about that at all. I'll finish by mentioning an open problem. Hammond's problem, um, you can look at it. I mean, what I did is sort of basically the same as k equals two, two geodesics from a small interval. So we have this epsilon, now let's call it delta of L, should be R to the xi, or L to the xi, rather. Um, what's the probability you have k disjoint geodesics? Is there some picture, like the disjointness picture that I made when I like redefined what disjoint means, um, that that gives you this exponent k squared minus one over two? It, it the, if you look at bifurcation points, if you have k geodesics, then you'll get two k minus two bifurcation points. You know k minus one each way. Um, but the exponent is not linear in k, so it's not just it's not that there's k squared minus one over two bifurcations instead of one or, or instead of two. Uh, it's something else that's much more subtle. And, you know, you can think about like watermelons and all that, but there's not like a, uh, you know, purely probabilistic geometric picture of why you get exponents you do in that, in that kind of context. So is there some picture you can make even let's say for k equals three, which gives for k equals three, you should get um, epsilon to the fourth. And then k equals four would give you 15 halves. You know, where did that come from? <laughs> um, so that's an open problem. Anyway, I will uh, stop there. And again, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to do this. Thanks, Ken. Are the uh, any questions for Ken? Shall? Uh, th thanks for the nice talk, Ken. Uh, I just have two quick questions. So the first one is, seems like from your, the, the, at least from the slides, uh, you didn't really need to use any of the, uh, the control on the, pa the first passage value 
it seems like you only use the uh, the just the wonder like the SMA for the wondering of the the geodesic. So does that enter like into your proofs? Um, you mean the uh, the the estimates for for the for the the, the um, fluctuations of the passage time? Is that what you're talking right, about? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, yeah, it's, it's sort of hidden, I guess. When you, um, I mean, I mentioned how you reduce from um, n cube geodesics with different crossing points down to n disjoint geodesics with different crossing points, um, and then when you want to get from there to saying that that's unlikely to occur, then that involves the exponent chi and all that. And plus, it's you know, it's I mean, um, to control these uh, uh, these fat triangles. I mean, you're definitely using it there as well. You know, the the, the bad things that you want to say are you know small probability events that you can dismiss. Um, it's it's intimately involved there. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, the the second thing is maybe just something I just didn't quite catch. Uh, so in the in the small tube probability. So yeah. you, were, you, you were covering this, uh, you had this uh, rectangle uh, of length n, and then yeah. the, the width is like n, uh, like to the fluctuation, uh, the natural fluctuation length right. times the, uh, to, to like log n to a power. And when you say the, uh, if we look at just the, the point to point of the, all the geodesics between the two boundaries, their crossing yeah. points in the tube is uh, sub polynomial. The reason the sub polynomial is that because like you you're looking at the log n order of the log n times the the natural fluctuation exponent does that come from there or with, with high problem? Um, well, okay, so um, I didn't write out the the the, the details, but um, you you want to say that um, you want to when you when you bound the probability that there are um, let's say in geodesics, they're n cubed crossing points for, for some n. Um, and then you bound that by the probability that there's n disjoint ones. And then you can bound that by something that's uh, like a stretch exponential in n. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, that, that, of course, I didn't talk about how you do that. But, but uh, you know, once you get to the disjoint ones, then, then you can do that. Okay. Um, I see. Okay, I see. I see. So, so, so the expectation would still just be finite, right? So it, it's like with high probability is sub polynomial, but the expectation should be. Like yes, this. right. Yeah. Okay, that, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That, that was, that was, thank you for the clarification. Martin. So uh, two remarks, if, if, if you may, sir, Martin. Uh, the first remark is Erdős Sekeres. Sekeres. Erdős Sekeres. The second remark is that both Sheo with Timo and uh, ourselves with Timo and Ofer Busani have quite some results on coalescence of geodesics in exponential loss passage, which doesn't use any single uh, integrable input. So it uses queuing stuff, probabilistic stuff, geometric stuff, no determinants, no RSK, uh, no young tableau. Uh, so there are some results which in, in exponential loss passage. Yes, yes, thank you. Can. Um, yes. Are your uh, exponents that, that you assume the existence of, are they directional at all, or are they sort of uniform in all directions? Well, I'm, I'm using this, uh, you know, radially symmetric system. So um, yes, they're, <laughs> they're uniform. Um, you know, obviously in, uh, in, in, on the lattice, then that would be an assumption. <laughs> Any other questions for Ken? <clears throat> if not, let's thank Ken again. <laughs>